country with the sovereign debt default of Greece imminent? Um, what's the probability that the euro will break up as a currency? And how drastic would the loss of investor confidence be? That's a very small question <laughs> to ask uh, there. Uh, I, I think the situation regarding Greece is that, uh, as you imply, that effectively they have defaulted already. The only thing that hasn't happened is that the accountants haven't uh, 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 credited uh, their uh, Greek asset, uh, Greek bond account and debited the expense account. So that I think that uh, uh, they're not going to get, they're not going to ever collect uh, too much on those uh, Greek uh, bonds that they're holding. The, the, the problem with Greece in the euro is that uh, it can't deal with its debt problem uh, according to the usual ways of inflating them away if they're too high or just having a devaluation because they don't have their own currency. They're, they have the euro. So that's why we're seeing all of this turmoil about how they're going to do it. Uh, will the German, French, Belgian banks uh, agree to, to wear all of this? And uh, of course, uh, the Greeks don't like uh, Brussels telling them how to run their budgetary policies. So I think that uh, we'll see a default. Uh, I think it's likely that they're not going to stick around in the euro for too much longer because all, uh, all of these problems. The, the problem with the euro is a fundamental confusion of economics and geography. Uh, that is, they're on the same continent, but it doesn't make much sense for them to share the same money because those southern countries around the Mediterranean have very different economies, they're subject to different economic shocks than do France and Germany and some of the other countries that are on the euro. Um, we saw with the endowment model in the US that kind of became widely described to from 2000 to about 2007 that it kind of fragilised the system with you know, a lot of endowment funds buying illiquidity. So my question with my super, essentially a one-stop shop with you know, a simple model of asset allocation, would that possibly fragilise the system because I'm suspicious? I guess uh, my question, uh, I guess your question probably ties in with a question I'd put as well. Uh, no one's really thought about that at all. And I, I think that's something that's, that's not coming through in the system uh, or in the discussions. There was even, at one stage, a push for a standard 3070 weighting, which is insane. I mean, there's no way that's going to suit everybody. And that was quickly killed off. But I, what worries me is this, this, there's a sort of a sense of haste, and I'm, I'm concerned about it, to be, to be truthful. I think a lot of the regulatory changes that have been made uh, are rather strange at, at best. You know, some of the, the age um, setting uh, the limits that have been set over the years and so forth. So yeah, I, I think it could well actually make the system a little more fragile, mainly because you, you've, you've got a, a product that's, um, that may start to look the same right across the whole system. That, and that worries me because it places pressures on asset classes that just may not exist. You know, for example, in, in 2000, it was very difficult to get Australian government debt. There was very little being issued and you were just hoping to buy stuff that was in place already. Um, if, if you've got to find a 30% of everybody's investment and you've got to place that into government debt, you start to have to look for alternatives like mortgage-backed securities. Um, <laughs> God help us. And, and, but you're also looking at uh, maybe corporate debt and then trying to remove the risk with credit default um, swaps. Again, um, you know, if you don't have a proper insurance system in place, to, to create these risk-free assets, you've got problems. Yeah. yeah, well, that's part of my worry, is that, you know, a lot of these portfolios are completely unhinged. And uh, personally, I wouldn't want to be putting my money into it. And I'm upset that I have to put my money into, well, well as at uni, Post Plus, for example, working in hospitality. And uh, despite contributions every year, you see these things go down. Yeah, I, I, I think... 
Yeah, I, I think there's a big issue with hedging and it comes down to um, trying to look after individual needs and wants. And um, for some people, hedging makes sense. For others, it, it doesn't. And I, I'm, I'm a great believer in allowing the market to free up a little and let people um, make some choices, at least informed in choices, uh, informed choices. I'm, I'm very concerned about um, fixing one product and, and that's the end of it. I think we need um, some variety. And, and your point's well taken. You can actually buy products that are hedged, uh, you know, for, with foreign exchange um, hedges in place and so forth. Uh, but there, there has been some discussion about, um, in the US and in the literature, about you know, portfolio insurance as a, as a possibility. Uh, loss averse individuals may prefer that, and that pr that creates a whole series of problems. You know, yeah. Yeah. that reminds me of uh, eighty seven. Exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, Rubenstein had to fly back from Europe to watch um, watch over funds as they tried to bail out of the market, um, which of course they didn't do. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, there are serious problems, but I, I, I guess the point here is, and it's coming back to something that Ray said. You know, are we in a nanny state? You've got to take some risk. If you're going to earn returns, you're going to have to take some risk. If you don't want to take the risk, buy bonds. Do you think the financial sector is encouraged to behave recklessly because they know the government will step in and bail themselves out for the country? And if you think that's the case, do you think there's any way around that sort of relationship? Uh, so this is the too big to fail kind of argument. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I think um, you know people talk a lot about behavioural finance, and they they say um, that's the big thing to explain the crisis. Um, it's the madness of the markets, etc. There's nothing particularly mad about the market at all. I think if you look at if you follow the simple neoclassical model, the University of Chicago model, you just follow the incentives, and you'll see it explains pretty much what played out in the. Uh, in the financial crisis. And, uh, and yes, I do think there is an element of too big to fail. I think there is um, a case for, for keeping institutions small so that governments don't face the political pressure of, of bailing them out, um, which isn't to say that's the most efficient solution. So with keeping them small, you give up some economies of scale. Um, so th there, there is a bit of a trade-off. Uh, but there is, for example, in my mind, uh, very little doubt, in fact no doubt at all, that Ireland would have been better off if um, they hadn't had allowed a couple of these large institutions to take on so much debt in the private sector that the government was, uh, had came in to bail them out. In fact, I wasn't even sure that the government ought to have bailed them out in the first place. There's, um, Eugene Farmer actually uh, made an interesting point in that article from which I drew that quote. He said he believed that the government ought not to have bailed out the the banks, and he, he thought the whole thing could have been fixed up in two weeks if, if they hadn't been bailed out. Now, would they have been fixed up in two weeks? What were the risks? <laughs> he thinks no. Other equally eminent economists, Nobel laureates, all thought otherwise. It's a tough, it's a tough one to, to answer. Yeah. But Ken was caught. Oh. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I think uh, government guaranteeing bank deposits is fraught with its own risks. Because uh, that insulates uh, financial institutions, managers of financial institutions, from uh, uh, from from taking responsibility, full responsibility for their for their own behaviour. So, I think that uh, that the that the moral hazard uh, uh, aspects that that those uh, guarantees uh, set up are uh, are uh, undesirable. Uh, I don't I don't think that. Uh, that, that that's a good idea at all. Given that Australia is in a sort of a very uh, good position with strong fundamentals going forward with our resource sector, our position to China, so I guess our strategic geographic position, um, the weakness in America and the weakness also in Europe, and so these sort of currencies can't, can no longer be, um, I guess, relied on for, as to be safe havens, and including Japan with their massive debt problems and political malaise, do you think that there is a, an, an argument there for the Australian dollar to be a strong um, sort of, I guess, safe haven currency and for it to maintain its sort of, I guess, over parity with the, the US dollar going forward? And so then how does that play in with your predictions for a, a 77 US cents? Well, you, you just contradicted what I was going to say. No, it should be 77 cents. It shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be 99 cents. Context with the Australian economy and the rest of the world, how, can, how does the 77 correlate with, with the Australian economy in the broader, uh, I guess, context? Yeah. When, when, when people from Australia travel overseas, uh, everyone's impressed 
how cheap things are overseas. <laughs> They're doing the translation. The Australian dollar is overvalued. Now, uh, in ter I thought you were going to say uh, the Australian dollar becoming a reserve uh, currency for, for the world. That's an interesting question, but I think that that's some way off. With, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, notwithstanding its current, current strength. Well, we are the fifth most traded currency, so it is possible. Yeah, that's, just, that's just turnover, though. You know, yeah, that, that's just, you, know, you can make those things anything you like. If you count it by, sell the same dollar, you do it ten times a day, so you, you know that's what brokers get rich on. <laughs> when people talk about the Greek debt, I notice that there's a lot of Greek people saying that it's not their debt. So where where is this money gone? Who spent it, and who's it owed to? Can you tell me? The one thing people do say is that a lot of it's the German banks provided the loans to the Greeks. Um, so the German banks, a lot of the debt is owed to the German banks. So uh, a point some unkind people have made is that uh, the Germans, by helping out the Greeks, ostensibly helping out the Greeks, are really helping out their own banks. They have a clear self-interest. Uh, but they also have another self-interest, which uh, others have pointed out, in keeping the euro relatively low, uh, underappreciated and to allow them to have the exports. The thing about the Germans is that after the Chinese, they are the number two exporters in the world, you know, despite their high um, labor costs, etc. And, uh, and part, a small part of what helps them do that is a relatively undervalued euro uh, or a low value. So if the euro, wrote, if they resolve the debt problem, the euro would rise, would appreciate, which would make the German exports less competitive. Um, so it's a complex set of calculations that the German Chancellor and the German Central Bank has to, well it's not the German Central Bank, it's the European Central Bank has to make in, in order to work out what's the right thing to do. I don't envy them. But. Who spent the money? Greeks. Oh, the Greeks. Greece. Greece. <laughs> Greece is just a nebulous thing. What, I mean, the Greek investors. Uh, no, 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 government finances its deficit by issuing these bonds. It finances its deficit uh, by selling these bonds and they'll sell it to anyone who will buy it. And they use the funds to finance government expenditure, payment to civil servants by all, uh, all accounts, paying civil servants too much by all accounts and not having enough taxes, having Greek citizens not pay uh, much taxes. So the gap between their expenditure and their tax collections is the flow of the new bonds that uh, the Greek government issues. So they do the spending. Um, Ken, you, you said in the start of your discussion that we face very volatile markets, and I think we're all aware of, of that volatility. But I'd like your opinion on whether or not volatility is necessarily bad. Do we have too much volatility, in your opinion? Um, can you identify any reasons or perhaps suggest policy prescriptions if you think we've got too much volatility as to how we might control the volatility that we see in our markets? This is another very easy question. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Terry. It's not an easy question at all. Uh, well, the volatility that we see in uh, foreign exchange markets, it's approximately the same as the volatility that we see in other deep financial markets. Stock markets, markets for currencies, traded in deep currency markets. Now, um, it's there. Is it necessarily a bad thing? Well, if, if we think that there's a certain amount of tension in the economy, and this tension has to be taken out somewhere, uh, then you know one way for it to come out would be for the real economy to jump around. You have lots of unemployment uh, one year, the economy booming another year. An alternative way to manifest this uh, sort of tension would be in financial markets, in volatility. Now maybe this volatility in financial markets is a good way of releasing this tension in the economy. A cheaper way, it's cheaper to have volatility in financial markets because they're better set up to deal with risk to pass it on to people who uh, really are better able to absorb this risk than to have the real economy so volatile. 
So in that sense, the volatility that we see in financial markets isn't unambiguously a bad thing at all. It could be an efficient way of the economy getting rid of all of this excess energy, if, uh, if you like. Where does, it, uh, where does it come from? That's uh, something that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is much more challenging, much more difficult for me to answer. People who like volatility a lot, and it's unambiguously a good thing, and brokers, they love it. It's, a, it's an opportunity to churn the portfolio several times uh, a day if uh, their clients can uh, uh, allow them uh, to do it. It's like this old joke, this old Woody Allen joke, a stockbroker is someone who I give my money to, he invests it until it's all gone. <laughs> Any other questions from the floor? I've just got one more query for Professor Clements and quite a basic one compared to some of the others. Um, in your view, how much or do you, do you see that the money will continue to flow to the US in times of uncertainty, bearing in mind the fiscal position and the Nanky seamlessly endless value trips? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because uh, it is. Uh, 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 somewhat paradoxical that uh, that, that does happen, and uh, there's no doubt that it does happen. It's uh, the uh, it's it's the destination of uh, anxious money, and I think why that happens is because of history, the history of a huge economy, a huge financial sector, very liquid financial uh, sector. US Treasury bill market. Uh, and these things aren't fixed forever. Uh, we did see the center of gravity of world finance move from London to New York over the last uh, century. Uh, but uh, the, these are sort of part of the uh, uh, financial infrastructure which is uh, deeply embedded in investors' minds. And I think that. That's the reason we see it, and I don't see that changing fast at all. I mean, it changes at glacial speed. Do you, what would be a factor that make you think that would change, or what would need to happen for that to, to begin to change and move on to somewhere else? Oh, less rapid growth, higher inflation, um, all of the things that the British economy experienced when they are eclipsed by, by, by the US, uh, uh, maturing into, into old age, running out of energy, the demographics looking bad. I mean, it, it's not quite that way yet in the, in the US, but those are the sorts of things that uh, uh, would, would, would lead to the US becoming less attractive. Of course, you've got to have an alternative about uh, where this money is going to go, uh, you know, the usual suspects don't, uh, or, or, or there aren't any obvious alternatives that spring to mind at the moment, but uh, uh, over, over time the, the, these things will change, uh, I'm sure.